Welcome to our lecture online. After the successful landings of the Viking 1 and Viking 2 landers, we went through a tremendous dry period where no successful missions were launched to Mars for a very long time. At first, the, the five next launch windows were completely missed with no attempts. Then the Soviet Union, which I think at that time may have become Russia, uh, tried to launch two. Uh, they were called Phobos 1 and Phobos 2, but both of them had failures through the communication, not being able to get into orbit. And then a few years after that, in 1992, the Mars Observer was launched by the United States, but communication failed before the, uh, the ability to get into orbit, uh, to go into orbital insertion and to be able to start taking measurements from space. So about 21 years passed without any successful missions to Mars. Many of the launch windows were simply just passed in favor of other attempts. We, uh, we then started traveling towards the outer planets. We got a lot more interest and so Mars was for a while kind of forgotten. But then in late 1996, we had two successful launches. We had the, um, uh, let's see here, uh, we had the, Mar the Mars Global Surveyor and the Mars Pathfinder, which contained a small little rover, Sojourner, the little rover that could. It was the first successful lander with a rover that successfully traversed over the surface of Mars. Although it only covered a total of 100 meters, that in itself was amazing because it was the first time that a rover had ever been sent to Mars successful and actually traveled along the surface. It had a mass of a weight or a weight on the Earth of about 23 pounds, so slightly over 10 kilograms. It was six-wheeled and was capable of traveling as fast as one centimeter per second. Of course, it would only travel a few centimeters, wait for the next command, travel a few centimeters, because it had very carefully maneuver around some of the small rocks because it was so small and didn't want to damage it or get it stuck. So it took a long time to go to where they wanted to go. But over time, I think it lasted for about 80 souls, about 80 Mars days on the surface, traveling a total of about 100 meters. But what's also really interesting about this particular mission was the actual landing. They tried a very innovative way of landing on the surface. So what they did was they came down and of course they come down into the atmosphere to use a heat shield to go into the atmosphere to slow it down. Typically by the time they slow down to a terminal velocity atmosphere of about a thousand kilometers per hour, which is about 600 miles per, per hour, which is quite fast. You definitely don't want to land that speed. So then they deploy the parachute, slowed it down more, but of course, since the atmosphere is so uh, rare, rarefied, the parachutes don't slow it down enough. It slowed down to about a speed of about 150 miles per hour, which is still way too fast to come in on the landing. The heat shield was ejected, and then at a height of 1165 feet, that's only 345 meters, about the height of the Empire State Building, they encapsulated the lander with a balloon. So they just all of a sudden inflated the balloon, encapsulated the lander with a the balloon. They fired three solid propellant rockets to slow down some more. Then they ejected the rockets and with parachutes that were taken away. At that point, they came in and hit the surface at a speed of 31 miles per hour, encapsulated by that balloon. 31 miles per hour, about 50 kilometers per hour. And then the balloon just kept on bouncing and bouncing and bouncing, just bouncing back up and bouncing back down. Now remember that the acceleration due to gravity on Mars is only about a third of what it is on the Earth, so there are quite some bounces. On the first bounce, the equipment experienced about an 18 G force, so it was built to withstand that kind of punishment, nothing broke on the initial bounce. Then the subsequent bounces, they wouldn't be quite from as high and as fast, and so the forces on the equipment would be less and less. And eventually, after bouncing and traveling for at least a half a mile, the balloon came to a stop. At that point, they deflated the balloon, and the lander was in the right position, and the rover was able to come down the ramp and start traveling over the surface of Mars. But that was just a, quite a remarkable way of bringing something down to the surface of Mars. Um, it has, I don't know if it's been used since. I have to look that up because I, I don't remember if any of the other rovers use a similar technique. I don't think they did. I think they used parachutes and uh, retro rockets to slow it down and bring it slowly to the surface. That's a more secure way of bringing something down, especially the subsequent rovers were much bigger, weighed a lot more, and would have been a lot more difficult to come to a halt like that. 
The little rover did have solar panels that produced about 15 watts. That's an extremely small amount of power, but of course the rover was fairly small. There was a lot of surface uh, associated with the rover. And it also had non-rechargeable batteries providing 150 watt hours. So that's equivalent to what the solar panels could produce for about 10 hours. Now they were non-rechargeable and uh, they were needed for nighttime activity. And it, they lasted for about, uh, I would say, about half the duration of the mission on the surface for about 40 days before the, uh, the batteries ran out. Uh, the amount of energy contained in those batteries is about equivalent to 30 AA 1.5 volt batteries. So you can imagine a package of 30 uh, 1.5 volt batteries. That was the amount of energy that was contained within the battery. Uh, it was a highly efficient battery. On the, uh, on the rover, but of course once it ran out, it wasn't able to be recharged by the solar panels. There wasn't enough power produced to do it anyway, so they didn't bother with it. It did manage in the 80 days, in the 80 solar, in the 80 Martian days, it did manage to take 16,000 pictures, made 8.5 million measurements, and traveled about 100 meters across the surface, taking measurements of the soil and, and uh, taking measurements off some of the rocks. It was quite an amazing success and of course they used what they've learned here to deploy on future rovers that then travel much farther and did a lot of amazing things in the future but this was the first time a rover was deployed on the surface successfully and had enormous success as far as the data gathered and the, the things that they learned from how to control the rovers and and what they could do with uh, things traveling across the surface of Mars. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, the great success of the 1996-1997 period in which those two were launched towards Mars. Of course, the Mars Global Surveyor, another tremendous success. It was active for almost 10 years, taking measurements and mapping of the entire surface of Mars for 10 years. And we had learned a whole lot from that mission as well. Setting up, of course, future missions by analyzing the surface and analyzing the geology of the surface to determine where they should put the next missions, the next rovers, to gain as much information as they could. So it was an amazing success in 1996 and 1997.